Uh, thank you, Eric, and uh, good afternoon. Well, thank you for inviting me uh, to another ASAP meeting. It's always exciting to, to come and uh, just talk about things. My uh, topic today is arachnoidsis, arachnoiditis and syringomyelia, so we're moving away from uh, Chiari malformation to a different type of syringomyelia. I don't ha I really have no cl conflicts of interest as far as I know. All right, so let's just go into uh, they want me to talk about arachnoiditis and arachnoid cysts. So what is the arachnoid? Well, you have this thick membrane called the dura. Dura means tough. And then you have arachnoid, which is here. And then you have a membrane called the pia that's on the spinal cord. And between the pia and the arachnoid is a subarachnoid space, and that contains the spinal fluid. So three layers, dura, arachnoid, and pia. Those are the three layers of the meninges. And the CSF is between the arachnoid and the pia. So it's right in there. So this is an arachnoid. Uh oh. So this is an arachnoid cyst here. And this is a focal lesion. And I want to make a distinction between focal and extensive. Focal is amenable to surgery. Extensive, not so much. That's so this is a spinal cord here, and unlike the other speakers, I don't mind showing the gore. This is a, a laminectomy, and this is a spinal cord, and, and here's a big vein on the spinal cord. And the normal arachnoid is tacked up by these clips here, and then this, this in here is the arachnoid cyst, and it's pressing on the spinal cord. <clears throat> and the word arachnoid comes from spider, which is a arachnoid. Arachna, which means spider and oid in the image of, so it looks like a spider. But really, people, this doesn't look like a spider. I mean, that doesn't look like a spider. The, the idea, the anatomist saw it look like a spider because of these really fine fibers that ran across the subarachnoid space. They're normal, but in the, the next condition I'm going to show you, called arachnoiditis, the adhesions are much more dense. Okay, so arachnoiditis can be either focal or it can be extensive. It's focal if you have trauma, if you have an injury just to one area, and then you get a scar reaction just in the one area, and that's amenable to surgery. We, as I said, we can do a laminectomy over there and uh, cut the bands of scar, but if you have meningitis from a bacteria and it goes all the way through the through the whole spinal canal and into the around and this the meninges around the brain, then obviously we can't operate throughout that whole area. Okay, so all syringomyelia, about one in ten thousand people, and and usually young to middle-aged people, and all syringomyelia, or most of it, arises from Chiari or this basilar invagination. So about one in eight cases occurs from the spinal arachnoiditis or deformity, and, and even smaller numbers from spinal tumors. All right, so not one to 10,000, maybe one to 80,000, maybe one to 50,000. So it's a very unusual condition, but there, there's over 300 million people in the US, so you can see that still will be a sizable group, even if you only have 20 per million. Um, so syringomyelia comes from an underlying disease, and the disease in this case is either have arachnoiditis, it blocks the spinal subarachnoid space, prevents the CSF from, from flowing, and that can come from trauma or spinal deformity. That's focal, so that's amenable to surgery. Infection, it's extensive, usually not amenable to surgery. Arachnoid cysts are focal, not extensive. They're amenable to surgery as well. And uh, syrinxes uh, destroy the center of the spinal cord. And there's a lot, obviously the spinal cord is important. It connects the brain to the, the nerves for the arms and the legs. So uh, it can result in paralysis or loss of sensation. And it really 
a syrinx eats away at the center part of the spinal cord and you have gray matter here in this instance this is for the cervical spine so these are the nerves that are, the nerves here that would go to move the arms and those are being destroyed nerves back here are for sensation so you'll lose sensation and as the syrinxes get larger you stretch some of the uh, the nerves passing by that point and you can get what's called spasticity uh, from that so your symptoms depend on what part of the spinal cord which runs from the base of the skull all the way down to the first lumbar segment you can have a syrinx anywhere in the whole spinal cord and your symptoms relate to what's affected if, it, if the neck's affected that's the cervical area then you'll have your arms affected if it's a thoracic spine you'll get numbness in this area and probably have some uh, trouble walking because you'll have spastic legs we have a, th a theory of why these syrinxes develop and um, it's really all these series really aren't that important I don't think I think the most important thing is a, if you have a block you end up getting a syrinx and so if we relieve the block the syrinx goes away so here's that patient with the arachnoid cyst right here came in wanted to be shunted and uh, right at the bottom of the the MRI scan you could see this line here so and then you could see here and I have another picture of this later this is more like a pancake it should be more filled out and so this is because the cyst is behind here compressing the spinal cord uh, toward the front anteriorly and what we do at surgery is we take the cyst out here's the normal spinal cord and we put in this graft you don't always have to put grafts in when you take these cysts out. You just have to <clears throat> think about how much space you, you really think you need behind the spinal cord. And so before surgery, so, sort of had a, a block in here, and then after, not so much. So you can see here the spinal cord was being pushed forward, so there's no flow in front before surgery, and, and there is flow after surgery. And uh, the MRI, if you take away the cyst, here's the syrinx, and then the syrinx goes away. So the cyst blocks the spinal fluid flow, normal flow, causes the syrinx. And then if you take that away, then the syrinx will go away. Here's another person. He, he also thought he, he needed a shunt, so he came up and... Uh, you can see the cyst here. Here is a, what's a T1, which means that the spinal fluid looks white. So here's spinal fluid, and then here's syrinx fluid. So there, that's the syrinx. And here's our flow study. And you can see that where the cord's expanded by the syrinx, it's large. And then after here, you, you have some flow, but it's, it's abnormal around the syrinx. And again, what you do is you see there's a little notch here and that was an arachnoid band and cyst in there if you take that out the syrinx will go away so before surgery after surgery okay here's a mechanic uh, and he's a very hard worker but he has really bad pain and you can see here's a syrinx here here's a syrinx and he had spastic lower extremities. In other words, his legs are very stiff when he walks. And he also had a lot of pain. These MRI scans are always backwards, so if it's on the left side, this is, on the, this is the right side of the body. So he has horrible pain in his left thoracic area, and it's because the syrinx went right into the sensory part of the spinal cord, and that, um, that, is a, that causes a lot of pain in syringomyelia. So we did a myelogram, and you can see there's a notch right where the spinal cord's being compressed. And so that gave us insight. You can see this is the normal width of the spinal cord. That gave us insight that there was some compression in there. 
not a complete block, but just a process that was compressing the spinal cord forward. Similar to this, this is what's called the scalpel sign. See how they, you go from this diameter of the spinal cord and then it becomes more narrow? That's called the scalpel sign. Somebody thinks that looks like that. I'm not so sure. But here's, here's this, uh, you see this oval structure and you see how it's turned into a pancake? That's what we look for on our imaging. And that means we really don't see the cyst that well because it's made of this, has the same fluid in it as spinal fluid, but we see the effect of it on, pressing on the spinal cord. And then when we took this person to surgery, we do ultrasound through the dura, and you can see all these bands, and then here's a cyst. So this was, sometimes you have a cyst, that's all you have. This one, it's a cyst in association with some focal arachnoiditis. And you can see here that when we open the dura, this is a little out of focus because we're looking through the, this is the arachnoid, this thin membrane. But, so you can see through here, it's clear, it's clear. This is where the arachnoid cyst is and the arachnoiditis. So it's focal. You can see we can operate from this end, from this end, and if we cut this out, we r remove what was compressing the spinal cord. So that's amenable to our surgery. And you can see here, after surgery, the syrinx went away by removing the, the cyst. Okay, <clears throat> so those, those were arachnoiditis, uh, or I mean arachnoid webs and arachnoid cysts causing syringomyelia. I, this is called post-traumatic syringomyelia. That means you have trauma. This poor man, he's 36 now. When he was 29, he was on his motorcycle and he had what's called a fracture dislocation. That means that between the eighth and the ninth thoracic vertebrae, he pretty much tore his spinal cord from a fracture. So there was slippage in one part of the spine on the other, and he had complete paraplegia. In other words, he's in a wheelchair, and he's wheeling himself around, which is bad enough. But then, you know, seven years later, his arms start getting weak, and he can't, you know, he's, now he's, he's, he's working at a university, and his, you know, he's, has to work on his typewriter, but now his arms are becoming weak and his hands are becoming numb, so that's interfering with his job. So we wondered what was going on, and you can see that from his trauma, he had this Harrington rod placed, but above that area, you see a very large syrinx making its way all the way through the cervical spine and even into the brainstem. That's called, that's a syringomyelia. There, do you see that? All, all, the, the, you're not supposed to have that much fluid in the spinal cord. All right, so we, we took him to surgery. We removed the instrumentation. We did a, just a two-level laminectomy. We <clears throat> looked at the, um, the degree of scarring with the ultrasound, and we opened the door. We cut the bands. And uh, I think because he was young and because he hadn't had it that long as far as the extensive uh, stretching. He was able to, to uh, regain function. Now, a lot of times with syringomyelia, if you wait too long, uh, you won't get the function back. So it, he was able to uh, restore function, although that is a little bit unusual. Most people have a deficit if they have a syrinx. Uh, so you can see he went from this to this. So this sort of explains why he could return to normal. It didn't look like he lost any substance in the spinal cord. And this is the decompression. You can see there's a nice large space here for the spinal fluid to flow. So again, you have a block. The block causes a syringomyelia. You relieve the block, the syrinx goes away. All right, so, so we did a study with 36 patients and 18 post-traumatic syringomyelia, two post-meningitic, one post-surgical, the adhesions and the cysts, like I showed you, and then one pantopaque. This is this, an old dye that they put in looking for disc problems, and this causes horrible arachnoiditis sometimes. People were all young to middle age, and we followed them up over four years. 
um, and 11 of the people had, had previous searing surgery, so it wasn't an easy group to treat. Um, all the patients had sensory deficit, most of them were weak, uh, two-thirds had really bad uh, pain, neuropathic pain, some were spastic, and uh, eight were uh, non-ambulatory. They couldn't, uh, you know, they were in a wheelchair. These other people, they were walking with a, this was with a walking aid, and this was just, they were a little unsteady. So before surgery, the syrinxes were seven millimeters. They were nine segments long. So you could have really long syrinxes. You could have really short syrinxes like that. So we took, took the people to surgery, and we saw that uh, you could see that on the ultrasound, you could see some scar here and some scar. And, uh, yeah. and uh, you could see the syrinx pulsating during surgery. Um, after surgery for the whole group, the syrinxes got smaller, they got shorter, so uh, we were happy, you know, spike the football, well, we did a great job. Um, but uh, most people did do well, but there were some people who didn't do well, and we could see that, you could see that as time went on, sensory deficit was okay, subjective uh, weakness, uh, it seemed like it was, that was improving, the pain was a little bit less. But this group, we weren't really pleased with. You can see, even though one person improved a little bit at three months after surgery, we had six people who actually lost the ability to ambulate in that four-year period. So we looked at our results. We saw 28 of the 36 had good outcomes clinically. In other words, they said they were the same or better. And when we looked at it, we, their syrinxes got much smaller after surgery and much shorter. And we looked at their pressure transmission. We also looked at their myelograms before surgery. So the pressure transmission in the canal before surgery was, was quite good, and after surgery a little bit better, but not quite up to normal. Con contrast that with the people who weren't doing well, and uh, really their syrinxes didn't get any smaller after surgery. The length of the syrinxes didn't change, and they had really horrible pressure transmission, and, and most of them had myelographic blocks before surgery. And so it was a tougher group, and they didn't do well. So we really tried hard, even for the people with a lot of arachnoiditis, and we did laminectomies up to 10 levels long, in other words, 10 segments. And as hard as we worked, we realized that the less we did, had to do, the better people did. In other words, here's a syrinx diameter. So the syrinxes were getting smaller when we were doing less. As we did more, the syrinxes stayed the same or actually got larger. So the surgery's good if it's in a limited area, but if it's extensive, the surgery was not effective. And we thought the cutoff point was at four laminectomy levels. And uh, so four or less, the syrinxes became smaller. More than four, it was about a 50-50 proposition. Uh, as far as uh, long term, if we did four or fewer levels because they had less disease, um, most of the patients were improved by surgery. If they had more than four levels, most of the people were worse after surgery. I mean, worse long term, like four years after. They weren't worse right after surgery. It took a while. And then when we looked at the myelogram, if there was a block, in other words, if things were really tight, um, then all the people eventually got worse. If there was no block and there was just some adhesions or a band or something like that, then the people improved. Partial block, as you can imagine, um, most improved, but a couple got worse. So anyways, I'm just gonna ha let you feel the pain. Here's a guy with, uh, he had complete paraplegia, so we didn't want to do a, and, and, it, and he had adhesions. He had arachnoiditis 
over 10 levels. So we knew that, that doing a laminectomy and duraplasty wouldn't help much. So we were exploring this type of modality, going through the, here's the spinal cord here, and we're in the subarachnoid space. We're breaking bands here. You can see this is arachnoiditis on the surface of the spinal cord. And we're trying to open up uh, the subarachnoid space using this endoscope. And this is, so what we want to do is we want to break open the subarachnoid space so when the heart beats, there's some place for the fluid to go and some place other than going into the spinal cord. So this white stuff, that's scar tissue. That's, that's arachnoiditis. And we have this little, we're hoping that if we can get through there, we can open up into some fluid here. There we go. So when they talk about third ventriculostomies, it's a lot more elegant than this. They don't have as much scarring, but it's essentially that's what they want to do. They want to get some fluid flowing there. Um, so that is why, okay. So this, you see how that, that broke open? So, we're optimistic about this, but frankly, we can only open it in the back of the spinal cord. We, to really open this up, you'd have to go all the way around. So I think we'll need a uh, technological advance to take it beyond this. I'll just, the only reason I'm showing this is to just show you that this is not child's play. I mean, you have big vessels, big veins in the subarachnoid space. so. If you, um, if you cut one of those, then you're back to the starting point because then you have bleeding, then you have scarring, more scarring. So, all right. So everybody's life's tough. So thank you for empathizing with me. That's, that is a really horrible condition. I hope we uh, can improve its uh, therapy. But anyways, my, my conclusion is focal arachnoiditis or trauma we're pretty good with laminectomy, laminectomy and duroplasty. With extensive arachnoiditis, it, it depends if it's local or extensive. If it extends up and down the spine, we really, this, the laminectomy is not good for that. In that case, uh, you might need to use a shunt in the syrinx. But if you do, it doesn't do anything to the adhesions. It just makes the syrinx a little smaller. Uh, we thought this relief of myelographic block was the best way of finding out uh, how the people would do uh, long term. And if we relieve the block, we could reverse uh, this process and the syrinx would go away. And so we want to prevent the fluid from being driven into the spinal cord, forming a syrinx and then moving uh, during the cardiac cycle. If we do that, syrinxes will go away after surgery. All right, and a lot of people who worked on this project and uh, glad I could present it to you. So thank you for your attention.